All right. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Brett Toombs, who some of you might recognise from um, being our guest speaker in February last year. So Brett is a clinical psychologist and a professor at the Faculty of Medicine at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. He and his team focus on developing strategies to improve quality of life and reduce disability among people living with scleroderma. He is the founder and director of the Scleroderma Patient-Centred Intervention Network, otherwise known as SPIN. SPIN is a, patient, is a patient researcher collaboration that maintains an ongoing cohort of more than 2,000 patients from over 50 sites in eight countries. SPIN studies problems prioritised by people with scleroderma and then designs programs to address those problems and test the programs in trials. So some of you might have done the SPIN chat and the SPIN sled program with Brett and his team. And I was a moderator in the SPIN chat and I'm also a graduate of the SPIN sled program. And I can tell you that the programs that Dr. Brett and his team produce are amazing. And so it's a pleasure to welcome you here this morning, Brett. Um, there you go, I'm, I'm muted. I'm not as professional as I thought, right? Um, <laughs> So, no, it's great to be here. Thanks, Louise. It's it was Friday night here, so you, you guys are waking up after Friday night. And we're we're in the middle of it. Um, let me. I guess I have some slides, so I don't like. I think I can share them. Is that right? Yes, you can. Okay, let's see how I do that here. Uh, You don't know how, how do you do that, Louise, in Google? I've never used Google. So if you use, you'll see there's a little square with an arrow in the bottom, at the bottom where all the little icons are. So it's a yeah. square with arrow and just present now. And then if you present the window that you want to, that you have your slides on. Yeah, let me see here. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, can you see it now? Yes, we can. All right, so I I don't see anybody else now. I guess that's how it works, right? Yes, correct. If you're working okay. on one screen, it'll you won't be able to see anyone, but we can see you and we can hear you. Okay. Um, and I'll I've just asked everyone to pop questions into the chat so we can deal with the, all of those afterwards. Okay, so you'll moderate those, right, Louise? Yep. Yep. Okay. Good. All right. Well, th well, thanks everyone for for the invitation and letting me come to talk, speak with you tonight. Um, you know, us, Square and Victoria has been a, uh, just a wonderful partner for us over the years. I think we started partnering with uh, uh, Square and Victoria probably well before the pandemic, two thousand eighteen or nineteen, and uh, and been working with people from your your group for a number of years now, uh, including Louise, who's been a wonderful partner. So. So what what is SPIN? So I guess we say we do, you know we do patient engaged research to address problems important to patients. So what what does that mean? Um, you know we, we started back um, probably almost fifteen years ago now. Um, I, I came to Canada. I'm from the, I'm American originally, and started working in scleroderma. And the first thing we were doing, you know, nobody was documenting at that point almost anything in scleroderma that people were facing on a day to day basis. Uh, and there was virtually nothing on, you know, quality of life or uh, mental health, you know, itching and pain and all the things that are kind of real problems that people face, that all of you face um, every day. And, and we started documenting these problems and, you know, we were working with Canadian patient organizations. And at some point we said, you know, we ought to do something about this. There's, there's nothing out there for people with scleroderma. You know, and if you, if you have a more common disease, if you have cardiovascular disease or uh, rheumatoid arthritis or diabetes, there's more that you can do than, than just take your medicines. I mean, the medicines are critical. They're the foundation of you know, your healthcare, but there's also other things that are important. You know, you get physiotherapy and you can go to somebody who knows uh, what they're doing or prescribe exercises for you. Uh, you can, there's education programs on how to manage your disease, what kind of questions to ask your doctors. Um, you know, there's psychological mental health support. And there's something called self-management tools. 
And it's a, it's a kind of a funny name, self-management, because it doesn't mean man it, it got named this way back, but it doesn't really mean managing by yourself. It means you know, becoming better at um, you know working with your teams, knowing what questions to ask, knowing how to find resources, knowing knowing understanding when you can uh, do more to address a problem, when you need to get help, and so forth. So, so all these things are really easy to get if you have one of those common diseases. But there's really not been anything in, in a, for rare diseases like scleroderma. So, you know, gosh, again, quite a few years ago, we pulled together people from a number of different countries, you know, because we're there's not enough of, of us in any one place to do this very well. And so we began to work together. And we said, well, we ought to try to find a way to develop, um, put programs together. And not to put programs together, but test them to make sure they're helpful to people, and then make them available free of charge. Um, and and they don't they're not free to make and they're not free to test and they're not free to even provide afterwards. But we work with groups like your group, Scleroderma like Victoria, Scleroderma Australia, our Canadian partners, um, and who you know work with us to provide the funding we need to like for uh, Louise mentioned our support group program, and so we provide these programs to people you know, once we've tested them uh, around the world. So we have, we have a couple different parts of things that we do. We do we do a lot of research. You know, we started as a research organization, and we it's really important to do research on these kind of things. And we also now we do a lot of education <clears throat> that's not that's not research anymore. <clears throat> so and we're the Louise said we have you know, over two thousand people with scleroderma have gotten involved in our research, and that's you know being in our studies. We also have dozens of people uh, living with scleroderma who work with us. Um, in different projects. So whenever we start a project, we have a team of people with scleroderma who sit down at the table with our researchers and, and, and work with the team to make sure we get it right. And you know, that's one of, so, you know, we're, we're, we're much larger and I think much more um, effective than any group. There's something like 7,000 rare diseases out there. And there's no other group that's done the kind of things we've done in of the communities. And I think one of the reason for this is because we do have really good relationships with people with scleroderma and patient organizations and so we work hand in hand together so we build everything together uh, we uh, people participate in our studies and we work with patient groups like yours to to get it out to people and we, we had a lot of really generous doctors in, in australia we have centers in um adelaide and <coughs> sydney we don't have one in melbourne and i wish we did uh, although we work with two dentists that are excellent working on our studies in oral health, which is Tammy Yap and Matthew Lynn, who have done stuff with Clarendon, Australia, uh, Victoria. Um, but it would be great to have a center, but we have people who, you know, help recruit people to our studies and work with us. Um, and, you know, what we do is we, when we say we have a cohort, that means we have people with the disease who provide us information periodically about what kind of things are going through, um, what's most important for us to know about and then we study those and then we translate those into programs and we put those programs online or do them by via, via video conference so that you know we can get them to people wherever they live so <clears throat> so the research part of what we do is this thing called this cohort like i said and as, as um what we said we, we we had over two thousand people join at some point but it's been going on for a number of years so people come and people go we still have you know over 1500 people from I think, seven countries now uh, in Spanish, English, and French. And when it, should we join the cohort, if you're interested, we love, we don't have a center in um, in Victoria, but we we can also directly enroll you through our center. And you know, you register for for this the cohort. And every three months, we you know, we have a series of questionnaires that um, you send you an email and see if you'll complete. And they're on, they're on topics that patients that work with us have identified as really important. And I'll go through some of the stuff we're working on now in a little bit. And you know, you it's, it's you log in your computer, um, you complete the questionnaires. They, they take you know usually fifteen to thirty minutes, and these help you know our team and other medical experts understand the, the disease better, including the problems most important to people like you, and and they help us develop programs. So we do a lot of research to make sure we get our, our programs are really high quality before we actually even try them out. So what, what do I mean by, um, you know, these programs that we do? The, the first one that we did, uh, and we have a, a number of them that we're working on developing and putting together, 
But one of the things that the patients working with us said was really important was their, was their hand function, their ability, ability to use their hands, of course. As you go throughout the day, you know, you can't, you, it's hard to do much of anything, whether it be typing, you know, opening your car door, uh, opening jars and using silverware in the kitchen. So these are really important. That's one of the things people are most concerned about is what's going to happen to their hands and, and how well their hands are functioning. So we put together this program, and you can actually log in right now. This this um, URL here, the, the HTTPS at tools.spinsclero.com. And our main website is spinsclero.com. And so if you go there, you, you can find you know, all of our materials. And you can sign up for free and, and use the program on your own. And so what's it look like to use a program? It's it's a it's a website and there's uh, different modules here. So each module or each section focuses on something different. So one section focuses on um, you know using your thumb that you need to grasp and hold objects. You know making a fist so you hold holding things with handles. Ex you know extending your fingers so if you're um, doing things like using your cell phone, typing, and so forth, and, and have keep maintaining your wrist flexibility. And each of these modules has a series of different exercises. And you know, these are just a few pieces of the um, what's there. And you'll see there, you know, there's, the, it has examples of the different exercises that you can use to keep your hands in good shape and prevent them from getting worse. And they have different exercises depending on you know how severe your hands are. So there's some exercises for people with mild to moderate uh, hand function uh, difficulty and some that are more severe, and we've adapted the exercises for both groups. Um, and you'll see here there's videos on how to do them. We have you know, charts on tips to avoid common mistakes and all sorts of other information about this. And what's what's nice about this, we keep saying we're an international group, and this is we, we have all sorts of programs. We couldn't do all this by ourselves in Montreal. And this program was actually developed by uh, two doctors who take care of people with scleroderma in Paris, France. Uh, Luc Mouton and Serge Pochado, and it was filmed, all of the video, it's very nicely done, all the video work was done by uh, Jupe Welling, uh, who Louise, I, you might have met in your travels along the way. Uh, Jupe was, has been involved with SPIN for many years, and is a really good amateur videographer, and, and he took the train from the Netherlands to Paris uh, like several times, and worked with Luke and Serge, and, and did all the filming of, of their exercises and the patients here that were participating in this. So I encourage you to if to go ahead and go online and sign up and give it a try. And it's like like we said, we we did all the research on it on this, the background work. We put the program together with people patients in our group. We tested it, and now it's out there. It's available, and you can you can use it whenever you want. Um, Louise mentioned this program just to give you an idea what what kind of programs we have. You know, way back, uh, and Louise, I think you know probably Maureen Salve from um, the Toronto area in Canada who's been involved with us in the beginning. Uh, she's really, a, like, like you, Louise, a go-getter and, um, and, and has scleroderma. And, you know, we, we worked together a lot in getting SPIN off the ground. And she kept saying, you know, here at Scleroderma Canada, we, we go out and we ask our, our local groups for a lot, and we're not giving back as much as we should be, I think. And so, and, you know, the biggest thing they do are the support groups. But running a support group is, is a tough job. And if you think about a model or a way to do things, it's a tough model because people with, you know, people with a bad disease and who have a lot on their own plates, you know, their own personal lives or jobs in some cases, are trying to organize and run a group for other people with lots of difficulties and often with no training on how to do that. And there's lots that go into this behind the scenes in, in putting a support group together between you know, organizing it and <clears throat> having, you know, recruiting people, um, having speakers come and talk about it, uh, you know, you know, working with different personalities and, and ensuring that everybody has a good experience in the group. So, you know, this is another thing. Well, we made, many years we went and did all our research on, on how, what makes a support group work well? What do you need to do to be a, a good leader and to make it work? So after about eight years of doing this research, we, <clears throat> we, and we get research money for all these things, which is good because what we do is we'll get research money from something they call the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. They pay for our research. It, it pays for us to provide these programs since we're testing them so we can provide those for free uh, to people in the community. And, um, and then you know, we do our studies and then 
And then we, we've done two things two things at once. We've, we've provided a good program and we've done the research we're supposed to do to test it. But this is a 13 week program. It's a one session a week, it's all by video conference. And each session lasts between 60 and 90 minutes. Um, and it's all by video conference. And each, each, each week talks about a different topic in the group and I've mentioned some of them before. And Louise went, went through the program as she mentioned. Um, and when we did our trial, it was, and we were lucky because Laura Dye does, does the English uh, language groups, and we're, we're she's, she's from the state of Michigan in the, in the United States, and someone suggested we talk to her at one point, and when, when I got on the video with her, it was really clear that she was very, very good at what she, she's been working with groups for many years uh, through Scleroderma, and so instead of just getting her advice, I recruited her to see if she'd lead these group, the training groups, and she's done that now for since we started this several years ago and just does a fantastic job. She's, Lori is uh, exceptionally good at this. And you'll see this, so when we ran our trial or our test of this, we had about you know, 75, 74 people got the training in the trial and 74 people had to go on a wait list, but they got it as soon as the trial was over. And so 100, almost 150 people went through it in the trial and everyone rated this for their satisfaction. And when the score was like 3.8 out of four, which is really high for this kind of thing. And Everyone who signed up attended over 11 sessions out of the 13. And sometimes I mean, people were doing this from their hospital, the hospital beds, quite literally. And we had really good results that it both helped people feel that they're more confident in doing what they had to do to be a, a successful leader, but also kind of reduce their burden and the stress in doing it, which is an important part of it too, because we don't want, we don't want to have people killing themselves trying to do this too, as much as possible. So it's, it's a lot of work anyway to lead a support group, but the, the, the more, the more we can reduce what's involved in terms of that burden, the better. So that's what we did. And, and now like, you know, since the trial's over, we still provide this group. Um, we do it as now as an educational program. So, you know, and, and I know that um, it's, it's scheduling can be a little bit tricky uh, from Australia because you're, well, you're 13 hours ahead of us in Montreal. But we, we find a way. Um, I think there's a 5 p.m. group going on right now, a training group, and someone from Australia signed up. So it's seven in the morning for them, and they get up early and do it. But it's there, and you know, if you're if you're interested in doing this and uh, support group, you know, talk to your lo your local organization, Victoria. Um, there's always room for for more, and we're happy happy to provide that. So what kind of other stuff we do? So we do groups and programs. You know, we, we also do work that that helps people understand uh, scleroderma better. And a lot of things go, because scleroderma is rare and, and there aren't treatments available for some things, a lot of things go into the radar. And pain is one of them. Um, so we, we did this study recently and we looked at how much pain people with scleroderma were living with and, and what was happening with their pain. And what was remarkable is that, you know, we found that people with scleroderma have as much pain as people with rheumatoid arthritis. And, and rheumatoid arthritis is almost defined by pain. If you say, what's a painful rheumatic disease? And, oh, rheumatoid arthritis is the, the model for this. But people with scleroderma have, have just as much. What's different is that, you know, people with arthritis have, have pain because, you know, in addition to all the other stuff we might get, like migraines and back pain and things like that, that we all get, rheumatoid arthritis it results in their joints being all swollen up and tender. But in scleroderma, there's a lots of different things, whether it be you know, swollen joints or contractures or ulcers, you know, painful gastrointestinal symptoms and skin involvement and so forth. So that was our first work in this. And this was the, you know, we had over 2,000 people in the study. And this kind of put it on the map and said to people, you know, a lot of rheumatologists didn't realize, they never ask about this. And they would tell us this, that we don't, we never knew this, there was so much pain here. So now, now we're developing another, um, we're, we're moving on from here and we're working right now and hopefully some of you will, will participate in this where we really want to look at each one of these factors that are involved you know and that can cause pain for people because what we know so far isn't isn't enough to do much about it but if we really nail it down and figure out you know when you have contractor pain and when you have ulcer pain how how often does it happen does it happen is it constant is it intermittent coming and going um uh, how severe is it and so forth. So we're really kind of drawing up a roadmap of all the way that pain affects people with, with scleroderma. And with that roadmap, then we would hope to bring in people who are really expert in pain itself and that can help us figure out how, how to 
do things that actually help people reduce their pain and live better despite having despite having these problems that cause pain. Um, you know, Louise mentioned mentioned the work we've been doing, and that's when we actually met uh, Louise initially. Um, is that when when COVID started, we we did a lot of work on different things, including mental health in COVID um, and vaccines. Um, and one thing, right at the beginning of COVID, this all moved very fast. So in April, April of 2020, we, you know, things were unfolding. At least here in Canada, is when it started to unfold. That you know we ought to we ought to keep track of what's happening with people's mental health and do something about it. And you know, we, we the first thing we did is we pulled together a group of people, patients we work with all the time. And I have to say, this is one a great example of why we work so closely with patients because I'll talk in a minute. We put together a program, the Spin Chat program, to help people get through those first lockdowns. And we're doing our, we, we, you know, we, it's a program we provide, and we also research the program. And we we thought that people were going to be depression was going to be the biggest deal here. And all the the patients said, no, no, it's anxiety. People are really worried. You know, they've got lung disease. They are on immunosuppressant drugs. It's a terrible disease. People are really scared about it. And you know. They they were absolutely right. So this is this is why we work with and listen to the patients on our teams, and that became our focus of our intervention. It did a little bit of everything, but we really focused on anxiety. And, and if you see these charts here down at the bottom, there's some really good news here actually. And I want to make, make point out that there's a difference between you know really going through difficult times, and, and I think sometimes people with like you who live with this have quite a bit of resilience and skill skills at coping because you live with a lot all the time and you know it makes it more difficult and it can make people more prone to have mental health problems but it can also really create skills and 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 flexibility and stick with itness you know so that you know and what happened here you'll see this chart here at the bottom on anxiety, and the, I, I'm looking at the left-hand side, I'm not sure if you can see my arrow here, shows that right at the beginning, the anxiety compared to before the pandemic shut up. And everyone, everyone was a lot more anxious at the beginning. But if you follow the line across the, across the chart, it came back down by the summer of 2020. That was the first time of the pandemic. And it's been down ever since. So people kind of adjusted and made the best of things. And the graph at the right here shows that depression symptoms didn't ever go up. Now again, this is what's really important here is to remember the difference between, you know, really tough situations and and you know feeling lonely but finding ways to cope and making the best of it as, as you can and mental health problems because mental health problems are about not being able to do anything right. So when you have anxiety, you know, you're not going out doing creative things to get by your day. Your anxiety uses like you're you're alert and aware all the time, and you're you know just. Uh, funneling through your worries in a way that makes you even more worried. And, and usually when you have depression, you stop. And and so those things, but and, uh, that's what we're looking at. And people did a pretty, were, now not everybody, it was a mixed bag. So some people, you know, actually got better. They they didn't have as many pressures on them. And other people uh, struggled a bit. But on average, things were both pretty good. Um, and I don't know if this is one of the reasons, but we, you know, as Louise said, one of the things we were able to do because we, we have so many people in the square deck community who are now we've trained over 200 people that are really skilled support group leaders. So we had a program at the beginning too that we quickly rolled out and uh, about 150 people did this where we, it was four weeks and three times a week people got on um, Zoom, I think our go to a meeting back then. And people from I think 13 countries were involved and each meeting, there was there was one of a support group leader like Louise uh, ran a, had a support group part of it, and then we also had some mental health professionals that came in and talked about things like how to keep moving during the pandemic when you're locked in, or you know, psychological tips for coping, um, and, and other things you could do. And it, it it worked pretty well. We had some good finding and helped help to help people manage their mental health. So one of the benefits of, of being so closely involved with the community like we are is that when this, when this came up, we were one of the only people in the world that could respond so quickly and actually provide something that that was helpful to people and um, and, and help them get through this. Um, you know, another thing we looked at is everyone had lots of questions about uh, vaccines. 
and there wasn't much research so people were, were wondering you know if there if there were there were more side effects for people scared who took the vaccines um and there was there were some recommendations about holding medications with vaccines and so forth so we we looked at about we had about 930 people who who answered questions about their experiences with vaccines this was way back in 2021 when they were and it hadn't been out for that long and we found that most people had gotten a vaccine if they could at that point um and there wasn't a lot of hesitancy. Um, so, so most people were getting them. People were staying on their medications for the most part. I think that I think in the second rounds and uh, later on the second, third rounds of vaccines, some people would begin to hold their medicines, you know, immunosuppressant drugs more initially uh, when, when they needed that. But the good news too is that there haven't been any more uh, reactions to the vaccine than anybody else, which is really good news for people. So, you know, people had the same kind of things that everybody else was getting, a sore arm and some fatigue and muscle ache, but just, just as much as anybody else and not anymore. And we didn't, we didn't have anybody in our study who had any kind of severe reaction. So, so what are we up to now? Um, and what, what can you do now? So in addition to having all those other programs, we, we have a, a new program now coming out that we've been working on. And this is what, what I mentioned earlier, the this, this self-management program um, that is about, you know, develop, you know tips and tricks to, to cope with different kinds of problems you might face when you're living with this disease. And so we, the SPIN Self program, we've, we've developed this over a number of years. We've worked with a group of patients to put it together and, and psychologists and rheumatologists. And again, it's based on modules. And it's, the, the hand program I showed you was all online. But we, we've learned over the years that it's a lot easier to do things and make changes in how you do things when you're working with other people. So we still have this program on the internet. It's like a, you know, it's kind of like an internet book with videos and um, instructions and tips. But we're also doing this in groups. So just like our spin chat program and the slide program, we have you know groups of six to eight people with scary gamma uh, get together. They they go, it goes for eight weeks um, and they go through these different modules and you'll see there's, there's all sorts of things. You know, here in the middle, there's a, there's a section on in healthcare. You know, this kind of things I, I noticed that uh, Louise and you were talking when I came here, you know, how to ask, how to ask questions. And you, sometimes you're dealing with, you know, people in our healthcare system, like anything else, go from not so great to the greatest in the world. There's all across the spectrum and they're very busy and running around. So, you know, how to prepare for your healthcare appointments, how to, what kind of questions you should ask, how you, what, how you make decisions in, in, in your healthcare, you know, what are, how do you, how do you figure out the questions to ask so you can know that everything you do with the treatment is going to have some good things that can happen and some bad things and, and how to figure out what those are and make the best decisions for you. You know, we have modules on coping with, uh, you know, appearance changes, your uh, digestive system, nutrition, fatigue, pain, skin care, and itch, and so forth. And again, these were all, all put together in, in collaboration by people with scleroderma and um, some of our health professionals. You know, and you'll see here, there's both, these are some of the, some of the pages from the program, but there, um, there's information, there's um, some kind of, you know, exercises and things you can try uh, to, to cope with some of these different things. So we, we have a lot going on. So, we, you know, we have in Montreal, I think there's um, that's 10 or 12 of us. And then we're kind of the, the coordinating center. Um, and we work with, again, people in uh, all over the world that um, have research questions um, that, uh, that have needs that they've identified. And we try to put together, uh, you know, studies that address those needs. And we, these, these are these are some what we call infographics. These are just like some examples. And you can find those on our website too, and they explain what we've been doing in research. And I've used a couple of them in, in the slides today. Yeah, one of the, one of the most exciting I think projects we have going on right now, which is interesting to me because I'm a psychologist, like Louise mentioned, but our, our our program is basically focused on what are problems that are important to people on a day to day basis, not just psychology. And this is one 
that oral health and dent dental issues is this is a big issue that when we go out and ask people what we should be studying, this comes up. So this is something we're working on right now. And I'm not, we're not, I'm not a dentist, so our team is not going to run any trials in, uh, in dent dentistry or oral health interventions. But we have so many people involved that we can really go out and map. We're mapping right now what's been done and what people know about you know, oral health problems and scleroderma and, and solutions and management. And, and then we're going to do uh, launch a you know, questionnaire for healthcare providers and uh, like people like you. And kind of with a couple thousand people involved, map really what are the key issues. And then we can help other people too who are dentists and professional oral health to begin to address those things. So they really haven't been addressed very well in scleroderma. And th this is what I mentioned before. We're working with two people um, out of Melbourne. So Tammy Yap and Matthew Lynn are two young, uh, I guess everyone's young now for these, these days for me, but two, <laughs> two probably middle-aged, but who, people who are young to me, uh, dentists in Melbourne, and they're, they're wonderful. And I think uh, uh, your group for uh, linking us up to them. I actually, the way we found them is because your, your group is going to Australia has such wonderful resources and your oral health research for patients was really nicely done. And I asked them, ask who did that. And that's how we got in touch with them. So they're working with us in this project. Um, and we, one of the things that, again, I keep mentioning again and again, is we really, I think we're good at what we do because we don't do it alone. We do it with, as part of a community here. And we, we really rely on patients to help us decide what we should be studying and researching to actually do the studies the best way possible, you know, to help us understand what it is we found. It's not sometimes not so obvious when we see why, you know, why did we find this? Why does, how does this reflect what you're living with? And then to get the results out to people, you know, both the patients and to doctors and healthcare providers so they can use them. So we really rely on people like you to do that. You know, so there's many ways you can you can be involved, and of course you can sign up for our studies and be a participant, which we'd lo love to do. And if you get in touch with me um, by email, or Louise can help you get in touch with me, I'd be happy. I would really be thrilled to sign you up. Yeah, we also consult with patients. So this is this is something we did. We did a survey. So in addition, in addition to all other work, you know, we go out and we we ask people. And what it is that we should, this is a study, so this, is the, this is the front page of a study we published um, because we wanted to share what patients thought we should be researching, but not just us, so we share it with other people too, because then they can understand what the most important topics are that we're not doing a good job addressing. So this is, we went out and did a survey for 150 or so people with scleroderma, and they, and they helped us identify some of the topics we should really be focusing on. Some of them are, you know, oral health came from that, uh, looking at work, and, and what are some impediments to working and so forth with scleroderma is, is, is on our agenda because of this and, and some other ones. Um, and then we also have advisory teams. So these are just a bunch of different projects we're doing. You know, spin dying at the bottom is a project on uh, nutrition um, and diet information. Spin care is a project we're working on on supporting caregivers, people, loved ones for people with scleroderma, paces on exercise, and another ones, but now for each of our projects, when we, every time we start a project, we we look for people with scleroderma to join our teams, and we usually have about um, you know between four and eight people with scleroderma on each of our research teams. And right at the beginning of the project, you know, we know we should be working with oral health, and we meet we meet with the um, we bring in some researchers and experts that know more about the topic than we do. That's always important. And we also bring in uh, patients who are keen to work on the topic. And we, you know, provide the information that we've gotten from patients, what they think we should be researching. And the patients help us decide what are the questions we should be answering and, and where we want to go with this in the whole long run. So we work really closely. It's really, it's really one of the nicest experiences I have as a researcher. And, and I work across different areas, not all in scleroderma. One of the nicest experiences is, is, is working with people with scleroderma together and it's a nice model, and I think people are reali realizing more and more that doing these things gets helps us to get research work done that's a lot better and a lot um, better targeted to what to what you need. And that's our job, right? So no matter where we are, uh, really, you know, people here in Canada, as our taxes pay for what I do, you have people like that in Australia. So we need to be we need to be working with the community and making sure that we do do what's best for the community. That's in, that's in the, in the end our goal. So, you know, if you're interested, again, 
when we put an advisory team together, we usually have a person or two that we've known before and worked with, so they, they're comfortable working and they asking questions, telling us when we've got it wrong, which is really important. And we also try to bring in people we haven't worked with before. And just so we get in diverse viewpoints and diverse experiences. So we'd love to have any of you, you know, join our group as an advisory team member. And you know, we, we start a new advisory team whenever we start a new project. You know, so every six months or a year, we'll start something new and, and we'll go out and, and we have a list of people who've said they want to be on an advisory team and what topics they're interested in. And then we, we get in touch with you. And yeah, we'd love, to, we'd love to have any of you join in, in that capacity. Um, and then I think a lot of you know Amanda Lowry Jones from, uh, uh, from Victoria and who heads also Square in Australia. Um, but, so this is our steering committee. So this is the other role that patients can take. And you'll see that it's almost half of the people on the steering committee have scleroderma. And when we first started this, the program has been, we had a steering committee with scientists, researchers, and doctors. And we had an a overall patient advisory board uh, with people with scleroderma. And then we realized that it really didn't make a lot of sense to have two groups. So we brought, we brought them all together. And I think this is one of the, the again, the nicest features of what we do is that, you know, this group, makes all the big decisions so we you know what again in the end game where what kind of grants and proposals should we be putting in to get funds to do projects of all the projects which we should be doing which ones are the most important um you know if, if someone wants to partner with us do we put resources into that or we do choose something else so this so this is i think it's, it's really it's patients as leaders and decision makers and again that again that's really important for us making the right decisions that meet the needs of the community. Um, so that's another way. That's another way to engage with people. And we're really, we're really keen on continuing to get better and be a more patient-centered organization. In fact, we have a we have a postdoctoral fellow, and what that is is now nowadays when you do your PhD, your doctoral degree, it's not enough training. You have to get more. I, I still remember being in my last year of my PhD, and I was a naive person. I didn't understand this, and someone said, "Where are you going to do a postdoctoral fellowship?" And I said, "What's that?" And I said, well, you have to do one. You, have to, you don't have enough training yet. And I thought it was done, but I wasn't. In any case, so we have a postdoctoral fellow from Perth who came to Canada to work with us. And she's leading our work on, we do now, we're doing research on patient engagement and how to better work with the community that we really make a lot of effort at it. Well, now we're trying to get smarter at it too. And, and Claire is uh, in charge of that. And so we're, we're doing new things to engage people. Like <clears throat> we got the Scleroderma Canada meeting last year. You know, we presented all of our research to patients and we presented together. So each of our projects was presented jointly by, we co-present the projects with patients who explain, because they've been involved in them. So we, you know, research and the patients together present what we're working on. That was really effective. And I think it helps us communicate really better what we're doing and why it's important and, and so forth. So again, I think my message here is, you know, we hope we're meeting the needs of your community. We hope you get more involved and don't, you know, don't be shy about it. Uh, we're we're really keen on having people with with scleroderma who who want to help working with us, and we we'd love to to meet you and um and, and have you involved. You all, I know you're all busy and have to have a lot to deal with, but if you think you have some bandwidth for this, we'd love to talk to you about it. So these are we you know I keep saying we're very fortunate. To have, these are all the people who help us through funding, and you'll see that uh, scleroderma Australia, scleroderma Victoria are part of this. Uh, so a bunch of the Canadian groups and, and others that, you know, help us pay for the salaries of the people that are working on all these things and and all the things that we do. And, yeah, and I don't know if any of you go to the, there's a Scleroderma World Congress that's going to be in, in Prague um, in, um, next year, and we're, we'll be there, and maybe some of you will get to be there. I don't go to conferences anymore. I, I don't like to travel. I'd rather be here with my family, but that's one conference I, I always go to because it's such an, it's an important one. So. Maybe we'll get to see some of you there. Um, and, you know, you can follow. It would be great if you follow us. If we're, on, we're on Twitter and Facebook, and we have our website here. Uh, if, if any of you want, want to figure out what it is we're up to and, and, and follow what we're doing um, more frequently. So, and that's, so I'd, be, I'd be, love to take any questions or, you know, talk about any, talk about anything that we, I haven't addressed that would be, uh, you know, helpful to talk about.